There are many bizarre stories surrounding the infamous Manson family. Outside of the horrific murders they carried out in August of 1969. Before those awful crimes, Manson was a well known figure in the hippie and counterculture of California in that time, and was deeply ingrained in the high end of the LA music scene. Through those associations came an incredible curio that the Beach Boys, legends of popular music, recorded one of Charles Manson's songs. As a child, Manson was musical, singing with gusto on his otherwise reluctant visits to church and plonking on a home piano. It was about the only thing he ever showed any application or interest in, being otherwise incorrigible. Focusing on crime for his juvenile and early adult years, he seemed to have left that interest behind. But at the end of the 1950s, after receiving a stretch for pimping in New Mexico, Manson was sent to McNeil Island Penitentiary. There, he would meet another infamous criminal, Depression-era gangster Alvin Creepy Carpus. And this would set in chain the series of events that brought Manson to L.A. Carpus was an expert steel guitar player, and Manson, always on the lookout for what someone could do for him, and with plenty of time on his hands, asked the gangster to teach him how to play. The younger man's mild manner and willingness to learn appealed to Carpus, who taught him as much as he could. Then in 1964, Charlie first heard the Beatles on the radio. According to contemporaries in prison, his reaction was mixed, but transformational. He became slightly obsessed with Beatlemania, in a mixture of awe and jealousy, and redoubled his efforts towards music, beginning to write his own songs in prison. Transferred to Terminal Island in 1967, in preparation for release on parole, he continued to work on music, but was reportedly uninterested in rejoining society. Against that feeling, the parole board released him in March 1967. Adjusting to his situation, he did what any good con man and hustler does, and headed for where the marks were. In San Francisco of 1967, the hippie movement was in full swing during the so-called Summer of Love, with tens of thousands of disaffected young people descending on the city and its surroundings. After the initial atmosphere of peace, harmony and acceptance, even by mid-1967, some darker characters had appeared on the scene. Enter Manson, who arrived in Haight-Ashbury, the epicentre of the movement. For a time he simply observed the street music and wannabe gurus preaching the articles of hippie faith on street corners. Then he became one of them slowly recruiting the mainly female members of what would later become known as the family. With that support system in place, Manson headed to L.A. in an old school bus to pursue his real dream, a career in pop music. He had met an actor named Phil Kaufman in prison. Kaufman, who later became a loose associate of the family, had connections in the music industry and gave Manson the name of Gary Stromberg, a producer. Stromberg was initially impressed with his music and booked him for an R session at Gold Star Studios, an LA institution that had hosted such luminaries as Phil Spector and Brian Wilson. The tape still exists today and shows a disorganized Manson who only had partial songs. He was also nervous and seemingly unable to take direction. Uni Records, a subsidiary of Universal Music, that Stromberg was touting Charlie to, didn't think he was ready. Following this first rejection, in 1968 Manson decided the path to success was to form a band. The Milky Way played their one and only gig at a Topanga Canyon bar. They immediately disbanded and Manson went back to solo. Charlie's next move was to send out the family girls to make contact with any musician they could find on Sunset Strip. After two of them were picked up hitchhiking by Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys, they excitedly told Manson, who headed to Wilson's house with the family that night, to wait for him to come back home. 
Dennis Wilson returned at 3 a.m. from a recording session. Initially frightened by the family in his driveway, Manson reassured him by kissing Wilson's foot. It would be the beginning of a near year-long open house at 14400 Sunset Boulevard. Wilson was open to Manson and the family's shtick. He had just been divorced, and the Beach Boys were not doing well commercially at the time. The accomplished con man played on Wilson's insecurity about his musical talent, gave him adoration, and plied him with the family women. Wilson came to call him the Wizard. While the family thoroughly sponged off him, Wilson developed an interest in Manson's music, and the two talked of collaboration and wrote together. Terry Melcher, a major record producer and son of Doris Day, was a friend of Wilson's, who also came into contact with the family, and this association would lead to the later atrocity at the house on Cielo Drive. By August 1968, the Beach Boys were going on tour. Wilson's lease at the house was almost up, and bled white by the family to the tune of a hundred grand. He wanted rid of them. The family moved on to Span Ranch, but a personal relationship of sorts between the two men continued. In late 1968, Wilson recorded the Manson song Cease to Exist, with the Beach Boys retitling it Never Learn Not to Love. There was no doubt that this was Manson's song. According to Greg Jacobson, another close friend of Wilson, they may have worked a little on it, and the Beach Boys definitely put their own stamp, but Manson wrote it. The lead singer of the Beach Boys, Mike Love, said he wasn't told that Manson had written it and would have preferred not to be associated with him. Wilson credited himself alone as the writer. When the record was released, problems started. A week after the Tate murders at Cielo Drive, an enraged and short of cash Manson turned up at Wilson's house. According to Ed Roach, the Beach Boys photographer who was present, threats were made to Wilson's son, and the Beach Boy gave Manson all the money in his pocket and a guitar. No one knew at the time that would be a very wise move on Wilson's part to placate Manson. Privately, Wilson said that apparently Manson was enraged not that the song had allegedly been stolen per se, but that the lyrics had been changed. Manson appeared to confirm this in prison interviews years later. Wilson also said that Manson and the family had been compensated more than adequately by sponging off him for months. The story of Manson's foray into the music industry and his associations with one of the biggest pop groups in history has along with many other fascinating and bizarre stories from the family era, become no more than a postscript to the brutal crimes they committed. But it is still an extraordinary piece of history, and a story that perfectly represented the times on the west coast of the USA in the late 1960s. <laughs>